Hello. So, I am excited about today's show. We have a wonderful special guest. Um, before I introduce Nicole, let me introduce myself. I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a parent, retired teacher, advocate for parents like you, because we want our kids being successful in the classroom, right? So today we have a wonderful guest who I think probably gets the award for the most hats. She's a parent, she's been a teacher, she's an educational consultant, she's an author, a blogger, a podcaster, a oh speaker, and probably you do a little bit of, um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but house cleaning and all these other things that we have to do, right? All these hats that we wear. But Nicole, Eric, and I always like stumble when I want to say your name. So can you say it for me, your last sure, name? Sure, no problem. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Eridix. Eridix. Okay, yeah. good. And um, Nicole has just finished writing, and her book is hot off the printing press now as we speak and being Literally. delivered in warehouses and sent out worldwide. Um, but she has written this new book about how teachers can modify curriculum for students when that's needed. And as a parent, I think it's important for us to know just a little bit about modifying curriculum. Not that I'm saying all parents have to take on this role, but I think when we have conversations with teachers as parents and we say, well, what about, could we try this? And Nicole is going to give us some you know, specific um, examples today that you can build on, that you can share with your child's teacher, let your child's teacher know about Nicole's book so they can get it. Um, we'll also be giving away one of Nicole's books. Mm -hmm. so all you have to do is type in the comments, modify, and just wait a couple minutes and do that <laughs> because <laughs> I'm gonna connect uh, my bot to that. But you will be entered into a giveaway to, re or to win one of Nicole's books. So we are gonna get started with our show. Nicole does have some slides of specific examples, but we also want to be here to answer your questions that you have. Um, and sometimes parents, like it's, you know, it's like that fine line between does my child just need accommodations? Are there certain subjects maybe where they, they do need the curriculum to be modified? Um, so Nicole, first of all, if you want to add anything about yourself, and then maybe you can give us, I know you have a, a very good way of explaining the difference between an accommodation and a modification, and that might be a good kind of starting point for us. So welcome, sure. Nicole. Thank you so much for having me again. Yes. Um, <laughs> I believe it's been exactly, just just about exactly a year since I was here and uh, talking about finishing off my book. Um, and like you said, it is literally hot off the presses. It was delivered to the warehouse on Monday, and um, we had a little bit of a glitch in the um, in the release date, and so people may have seen that on online. You know, it's coming out on Monday, April 2nd, but uh, it actually has been moved to April 20th. However, I just received word from the publisher that if you did pre-order the book uh, from the brookspublishing.com um, site, it is in the mail today. So, um, and if you are ordering off of Amazon, or if you have ordered off Amazon, it's on its way. <laughs> so, <Okay>. yeah, <laughs> but I'm thrilled to be here because I think parents are a huge um, aspect uh, and they play a huge role in their child's education. And, you know, it, typically and, and traditionally classroom teachers, general education teachers, uh, have not had the responsibility of teaching and um, including students with particularly intellectual disabilities in the classroom. That uh, was generally the role of the special education teacher. 
And as we move now towards more inclusive classrooms, which is a great thing because as you and I both know, uh, inclusion and inclusive education is the gold standard for teaching students with all kinds of disabilities. There hasn't been any research since the 70s that has proved otherwise. So that's really important to know. Um, and so anyway, as we as teachers have, you know, the um, have more students with various needs coming into their classrooms, uh, some teachers haven't quite yet um, either learned or been trained as to how to modify and adapt, you know, make accommodations for students in order to give them access to the curriculum and to make the curriculum achievable. So um, that's where the parents come in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And and uh, yeah, not suggesting that it's a parent's role because it's certainly not, but it definitely helps if the parent can know um, and have information to help the teacher when the teacher uh, you know, is, is basically wondering how this can happen, how we can make it happen, how we can have, you know, the child in the classroom and not just physically in the classroom, but actually participating in the learning activities, uh, everything from art to PE to math to science and and that's, you know, that's where these modifications come in. So, um, yeah, if, did you and have I think questions? I think, you know, you bring up some great points and I look at kind of like historically where we've been for inclusion and you know sometimes kids have been you know like you said physically in you know in the classroom but maybe at a back table with the para working on something completely different and you know maybe that's getting your foot in the door but that's really not the outcome that we want and what I love about your ideas, Nicole, is that you spend time thinking about this is what the other students in the class are working on. How can we kind of keep that integrity of that lesson or that activity, but change a little bit in order to make it accessible to all the students? Right. And, and just to kind of backtrack a bit, um, and, and the majority of well, modifications are directly related to um, curriculum for students with intellectual disabilities. So those are our students who are working below grade level, far below grade level. Um, typically, if a student is working only one or two grade levels below, they'll receive intervention support through um, the specialists at the school. They'll still work on the same curriculum as the other students. But if the, st if the child is has you know, been working far below grade level, that's where uh, modifications, curriculum modifications are needed and, and to include the students in that curriculum. So, and research has shown and studies have shown that students with intellectual disabilities are the least included students in our um, population, in our student population. Um, and researchers have identified curriculum modifications as critical to including those students in our curriculum. So if we really want to reach and teach them and be inclusive and not just in our schools and not just in our classrooms, but actually in our curriculum, then modifications is what we need to do. And um, I just have a quick slide here that I'll pull up and I'd like to sort of branch off into the differences between modifications and accommodations and where modifications fit in because I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of curriculum accommodations um, which are quite different to curriculum modifications. Right. And as I mentioned, those modifications are absolutely key to full inclusion for students with intellectual disabilities. So um, I'm going to try to remember how to share my screen here. <laughs> And yeah, we've got all these, so yeah, so if you click on share screen, then it should come up with PowerPoint. There you go. It says loading presentation. 
You're right on target. There you go. All righty. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so when we look at different types of, or, you know, inclusion in general, it happens at various levels uh, within the school system, and that goes from the community around the school down to the actual school itself, where, where the child is included in recess time and, you know, school productions and school activities. It then uh, filters down into the classroom where the student is a participating member of the classroom and is um, seen as a member and is, you know, missed if they're away that day and um, has friends that they play with. And then, of course, inclusion also filters down into the curriculum, which is where the student is actually included and in and participating within the curriculum. Now, um, how, how do we do that? How do we include students with intellectual disabilities in the curriculum? Well, there's a variety of ways that are, are not, um, they're sort of less intensive to begin with, and they typically start with uh, some research-based classroom instruction that the teacher is providing for all the students, such as universal design for learning. Um, the teacher also uh, can use um, intervention from the school learning specialists, um, have the student receive some small group support. And then when the curriculum becomes uh, inaccessible or unachievable, then that's when the teacher gets together with the school-based team, um, learning specialists, administration, and they start to develop an individual education plan for the child. And they start to think of ways that the curriculum can be um, reached, accessible for the student, and then, of course, achievable, where the student can actually learn and progress through the curriculum. And those are known, so the general over, sort of the umbrella term for those accommodations and modifications are known as a curriculum adaptations. And um, so here's that kind of umbrella graphic I was just talking about. So here we have, um, you know, that term curriculum adaptations that we look at as a school-based team to help the student access and achieve curriculum or progress in curriculum. And so accommodations specifically are um, ways in which we can facilitate learning. So for example, if someone has eyeglasses, we, or sorry, if someone has poor eyesight, we give them eyeglasses. Uh, if somebody need, you know, has some uh, processing issues, we give them extended test taking time. Um, accommodations are concerned with changes to the setting, uh, the way the material is presented, such as this overlay, uh, yellow overlay on the far right on the screen, um, extra testing time, as I mentioned earlier, and um, responses, you know, how the student responds. So, for example, do they respond, um, you know, through speech? Do they respond through text? Do they respond through, through typing? Um, so those accommodations are generally and widely known by by teachers um, don't, uh, you know, they're noted in the student's individual, individual education plan. The, the main thing to remember with curriculum accommodations is that the student is still working on the same level curriculum as the rest of the class. So um, there are no changes to the curriculum. So these accommodations are just helping that student get to the curriculum. And here's this kind of visual that I like to use for uh, curriculum accommodations. I like to think of accommodations as paved pathways to curriculum where we're just giving them, you know, we're facilitating access, we're, we're making the path clearer for them, you know, we're providing the eyeglasses, we're, you know, sitting them away from the window if they've got attention issues. Um, so we're just kind of switching things up a little bit to help them you know, access that curriculum. Whereas modifications, on the other hand, are for students who really have a limited understanding of the curriculum. 
Um, and so modifications make that curriculum achievable so that the students can actually not only participate, but can learn and progress through the curriculum. And modifications um, involve actually changing the curriculum itself. So the student is in the classroom with his or her same age peers, but they are learning the curriculum at a different level. It's not the same um, learning goals that his or her peers may have. And so, um, for example, uh, in this picture here, you see a text of, uh, or an excerpt of Charlotte's Web. And the teacher has modified the work, so she's modified the, um, the text to make it m less com complex so that the student can read the text while still um, participating in the um, discussion and the kind of overall reading of, of Charlotte's Web. So modifications I like to think of as a bridge to learning. So without that bridge, students are not going to, you know, be able to learn and, and participate and, and to achieve and to progress in the curriculum. Uh, you know, modifications provide that sort of, it, you know, bridges the gap. It kind of provides a way for students to just continue on and carry on with their learning like the rest of their peers. So. The only difference is, well, and it's a big difference, is that the curriculum is, is not exactly the same. So um, I'm going to stop sharing there. Charmaine, did you, do you want to yeah, talk so about that got, anymore? Yeah, we've got some comments. So welcome to everybody that's on with us live. It's great to see all of you. Um, Courtney is here with us from Ohio, and she Oops. says, my son with Down syndrome will start kindergarten in the fall. I want his IEP to be standards-based. I think he can learn a large percentage of the regular curriculum, but I want to include modifications in the IEP. And she asks, do I need modifications stated for each standard? It just seems like the IEP would be 50 pages long if I did this. <laughs> How do I negotiate his um, IEP to assure he's learning Common Core like his typical twin while making sure it's modified just the right amount? Do I even want modifications this early in the game for a kindergartner? Wow, that's a good question. Hi, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who I'm talking to. Yes. <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> so kindergarten, yes. Yeah. So typically, um, I guess a good place to start is knowing what your child, where they're learning at. So getting sort of an idea base of what they're capable of doing. Um, and then looking at the kindergarten curriculum, because yes, of course, you want the child to be learning from good quality learning standards. Um, you know, we have high expectations for typically, typically developing children. We need high expectations for our students with intellectual disabilities. So modifications, I think in terms of writing up the IP, now I'm not a special education teacher, so I can't speak directly to how the IEP is written. But I think modifications are a um, way of setting up the IEP for the student. When the material does become difficult, the modifications and the idea that curriculum will be modified is already in place for the student. So now correct me if I'm wrong, Charmaine, because you're more on the IEP advocacy side of things. Um, now, it, and I don't think it's modifying every standard. I believe that you can modify, you know, the statement can be modifying um, certain goals that you want your child to learn. Right, and it, you know, it depends on your form because each state sometimes has their own IEP form or each district, but usually somewhere in the IEP there's a section that 
you know, talks, usually it's like, you know, there's an accommodation and modification section. You'll write accommodations in the IEP. And then under that, there's usually a box that says, you know, does a student need modified curriculum? And in that space is where you could write in the modifications. So it doesn't necessarily have to be with each standard or each IEP goal. But, you know, I think, and, you know, as we write IEPs, it's always our best guess where, you know, we think the student might need some modification and, you know, we can always change that and amend the IEP if they don't. But, um, yeah, I think you do want to have that conversation at the IEP meeting. And I think it's always kind of like the Goldilocks gold standard of <laughs> you don't want too much modification, you don't want too little, you want just the right amount of accommodations and if you need to go to modifications. But, right. you know, I think if we start at the accommodation level and see if the student can be successful there, that's like great. And sometimes, you know, I know my son who also happens to have Down syndrome, you know, there were certain subjects or certain activities that he didn't need modification. So it's not like we don't want teachers to have the mindset like, oh, this student's going to need everything changed, you know. And so we want to pinpoint really the areas that they need that level yeah. of change, you know. And there's also the um, alternate achievement standards that are kind of a more boiled down version of the Common Core. They're still the exact standards, um, but they're, they've kind of been, oh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Charmaine, but. Um, yeah, they kind of pull out the essence. Yeah, the essence. You know? Yeah, and, and those can often be used as sort of the bigger goal um, when you're writing the IEP. And, uh, but I think, and I don't know if you would, I, you know, agree with me. I think there definitely has to be a conversation about modifications and using them when they're needed. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's look, because we also have some other comments and questions. So again, welcome everybody. Um, Courtney says that's great advice. She says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she agrees. Best guess, yes. <laughs> I don't want too many uh, modifications. Um, we did have, let's see here, Lissa asks, she says, since general ed teachers are not receiving much training in teaching kids receiving special education, how do they learn to do curriculum modifications? Great question. <laughs> because, yeah, as we were mentioning earlier, this has traditionally been, you know, special education teachers have kind of been the gatekeeper of curriculum modifications and, and held the key to it. Um, but now general education teachers need to be aware of what they are. Uh, there are some wonderful um, books that Brooks Publishing has put out called uh, Modifying Schoolwork, which gives you a really great um, overview of what curriculum modifications are. Um, my book, which I'll talk about later, is coming out that has the strategies for doing that. Um, in terms of other resources, I also believe there's one by June Downing, I want to say. Yeah, June has had some good books over the years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At this point in time, I don't know of any specific online courses related to it. Uh, I only know uh, book resources. Right. And they're few and far between, unfortunately. You know, and you can check, too, um, sometimes on your State Department of Education website, they will list, like, webinars that they're having for professional right. development. And if you see something there, you could mention it to the, you know, your child's teacher. Um, the other thing you can do in the IEP is you can write in training for teachers yes. and training for paras or... Um, because it's not only services for your child, but people that support your child. And I always tell parents, it's not like to make teachers feel defensive, like, oh, you think I don't know how to do my job. It's like, no, or your job is expanding. And, right. you know, we're looking at having the district provide support to you. So I want teachers to see that as a positive opportunity that they can get 
some training and if there's an inclusion facilitator in the district that can come in or a peer colleague in the district that can come right. and say, this is how I've done it, you know. So I think, you know, we always want to look at, you know, conferences, you know, yeah. workshops, books, but also having somebody in your classroom to actually show you can really make a big difference. Yeah, um, exactly. You know. Totally agree. And people yeah. like you, because I know you do some consulting with schools, you know. Yep, I do, and I'm actually, um, I've got some conferences lined up this year. Oh. Um, one in Phoenix, one in uh, San Jose so far. So, yeah, cool. I mean, you know, you can keep checking back at um, my website, because I usually announce what I'm doing and where I'm going. So, yeah, at this point, it's really just basically getting on, you know, the computer and... <laughs> I know, I know. Trying, yeah. And so, um, Sunny is here and she had a um, question. She said, which is the best argument for inclusion with modifications when they tell you that the student's IQ is quite low? Well, there is no argument. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the child deserves an education, which is uh, equal to that of his, his or her peers. It's, um, you know, there's federal legislation that mandates that student receives education in the least restrictive environment, which uh, is, you know, the general education classroom. And, uh, you know, that's what modifications are for. They're for taking the curriculum, the, the general education curriculum, and making it achievable for students who um, have, you know, intellectual disabilities or lower IQs. Um, that's what they're designed for. <laughs> I, I know. Sure. I think so many times parents kind of hear, you know, your child's not ready, you know, and right. they, they need to be in the special ed class and right. get ready to be included. They don't and, need to be ready. Yeah. So we want no. to dispel that myth. <laughs> yes. The, yeah. That modifications, that's what they're there for. They're there to to take you know the the general edu education curriculum and make it achievable for students um, who have you know learning issues and and um, intellectual challenges. So uh, they're definitely yeah. I don't. I would say that you might want to gather some of the resources, the wonderful resources that are online. <laughs> Right, right. to share with your um, school administration and show them what the purpose of modifications are and, and how they work. Right. And Lisa, or Lisa adds that, she said, thank you, she's in Texas, and the go-to is to send my son to the resource room in lieu of modifying curriculum. And so, yeah, you know, sometimes you just have to kind of draw the team back together yeah. and say, you know, this is another opportunity and we've got an alternative here that we can use. Um, exactly. And I don't exactly. know if you want to show maybe some of your slides. Yes, uh, yeah. Nicole, where you have like the worksheets and like, you know, some of your math worksheets and it's like, no, you circle the number and add these instead of doing this calculation. And so right. that might help people too to see some more of your examples. To visualize, definitely. Okay, so back to screen sharing. Okay. Let's see <laughs> if I can do this. Um, okay. And that. Oh, sorry. There we go. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, quick overview about modification. So, their purpose is to change the curriculum, and the way they do it. The way we, the way modifications change the curriculum is they can alter the content. So, for example, um, the student is being taught grade level curriculum, but they are um, learning things that are more suited to their level of learning. So, for example, say the class is learning um, about, you know, say a fifth grade or fourth grade class is learning about um, plants, plant cells, and, um, you know, sort of the, the functions of cells and plants. 
the student can, with you know, on the modified program, can also be learning about plants, but at a different level. Um, maybe they're you know growing seeds and you know actually observing plant growth. So um, in this situation, the uh, kind of the overall theme is the same, but the content is altered a bit. So in terms of what student is actually learning is altered a bit. Um, modifications can also alter the um, conceptual difficulty of the, um, of the assignment. So uh, much like altering content, the concepts are also altered. So that means to change the learning expectations of the lesson for the students. So say, for example, the class down here or in the top, can you see my cursor, Charmaine? Uh, yes. OK, great. So in this example up here, the students are expected to label the parts of the dog and be able to spell the word correctly and put in the appropriate position. Um, a modified uh, assignment where it's it's less complex, the teacher actually provides the words below and the correct spelling and actually even fills in two of those words in the appropriate spot and the student is to find the remaining answer and use the words below to copy and fill in. So that's taking the same activity but just altering the learning outcomes of that activity. Um, Another way to modify curriculum, and I'm going to get to several more examples as well, is to uh, use the same assignment and alter the purpose of the assignment for the student who's on the modified program. So this would be a multiplication assignment for, say, a grade two class, and or grade two or grade three class. And the student who is on the modified program might be learning to identify numbers, like the numbers three and four. So this teacher just simply has the student, you know, circle all the threes that the student sees or all the fours and copies them down if that's, you know, appropriate to their developmental level. Um, and then finally, uh, teachers can modify curriculum by altering the instructional methods. So for example, um, oops, an upper grade class might be doing a novel study and reading the novel and responding to comprehension questions, well, perhaps a student on the modified program does a PowerPoint presentation or creates, um, you know, a, a, you know, some type of um, project or some type of visual that relates to that novel. So those are kind of the four different ways of taking regular curriculum and modifying it for students, um, so you're altering the instructional method, you're altering the goals for the student, you're altering the concepts, and you can be altering the content as well. So how do we do that? So here are some examples. Um, teachers can, and, and how we do that is just through regular teaching strategies that teachers use every day for other aspects of the curriculum for their rest of the class, but they're just taking those strategies and applying it to work for the students. So, um, for example, this is a, a yes-no strategy, and basically this is a, here we have in the example is a grade eight science textbook, and the students in particular were working on filling out this chart, um, putting in the correct answer. Well, the teacher has modified that assignment and has, um, you know, n not so much changed the content because the, the child is still learning about, you know, density and buoyancy of water, but has basically changed the concept a bit, um, made it a little less complex, has changed the um, instructional method by turning um, it into a yes-no um, question as opposed to filling out this little chart here. And um, this just basically has the student demonstrate their learning by completing yes or no. And um, over here uh, is another strategy. So in this one, the teacher is using the same sheet as the rest of the class. 
and this is defined its strategy. And much like the one that I showed you earlier, the multiplication sheet, the um, where the students are all working on the same sheet, but the student on the modified program has altered educational goals. Then um, this is a similar example where the student is working on, while the class is working on um, learning area, surface area, the student on the modified program is learning to um, identify shapes. So, and I just used a, um, a fun app called SnapType. Yes. And this is excellent for teachers um, and parents who are looking to modify existing work and um, written work. Um, even, you know, you can take photos and, and work with photos, so visual images you can work with on SnapType. And you can actually type over the text. Um, and it's an app on your phone that you can use. So I love it. I love that one. Oh, I know. that. The apps that are available now are just really changing things, too, you know? Huge, yeah. Should I carry on, or does anybody have yes, any questions yeah, so far? I think, yeah, people are enjoying these, so thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next one I have here is Label It. So it's a labeling strategy that I use. And um, I've just basically altered the conceptual level of the activity as well as the instructional method because I've used um, a real face, mine, um, <laughs> instead of a diagram, um, which might, you know, can visually might not be as um, easier to understand. So in this particular activity, the students, this is a fifth grade class, and they're working on um, the skeletal system. And I've just, I've once again used SnapType. I took a photo of myself, and um, I, the, the student has worked with a para to label parts of the face. So um, still working with the same theme, the same overall theme of the human body. You're just changing the concept a little bit um, and making it more visually accessible and um, altering the educational goals a bit to suit the student that is on the modified program. Uh, this one is Webit, and teachers use webs all the time. <laughs> and this one is, you know, another way to have the student um, on the modified program show what they know. So in this situation, the class had been working on Egypt, and they were writing a quiz that day, um, summarizing some of the concepts that they had learned during the unit. And the teacher had asked the student to simply create a, um, a web of what the student had learned. And then afterwards, uh, once the web was created, there was actually some discussion between the student and the teacher as to, you know, these, these you know, specific aspects of what the student had learned. So it wasn't a written test like the rest of the class, but it was still you know, the opportunity for the student to demonstrate their knowledge at their learning level. Well, so. you know, and I know Dylan learned about Egypt that was in the curriculum for sixth grade, and he just was mesmerized by yes. mummies and all of that. Yeah. And, you know, what we tried to do as, you know, as a parent and general ed teacher and special ed teacher was to sit down before the units and say, you know, what are the big ideas that we want Dylan to learn? about right. this unit on Egypt um, and hold him accountable for that because exactly. sometimes what I see is kids being physically in the classroom and they have some modifications but maybe they're not actually having to show at the end what they've learned exactly. so like your idea of there's you know an oral discussion and the teacher is you know being able to you know, kind of dig and see what the child has remembered, you know, if they want to, like you said, do a project or something. But, you know, the thing is, I think one is it's good to have input into what those ideas are, big ideas are that you want your child to learn before that unit comes up. And also to make sure that the teacher is really expecting your child, they are going to be learning these, yeah. you know, as we go through all of our you know, lessons on this. Yeah, and the child, the expectations are still there for the child to learn 
and to progress through the curriculum, as I mentioned earlier on in our in the conversation. So that you know, assessing the student on what they're learning is part of that process. <laughs> And, um, you know, grading them on what they've learned is part of that, that process um, to see what kind of progress they've made. And they most definitely um, are a part of that. And, and, and it's, you know, reported to parents and, you know, the progress is discussed. But, yeah, that is definitely a piece of modifications, which I don't necessarily address in this presentation, but is certainly an important piece. Right. Um, do it. Yeah. And Jane had a question. She was saying, you know, what does the child with an intellectual disability do during classroom lectures? Right. So, well, you know, there's the um, there's the, there's a school of thought where we presume competence and we expose the child to as much um, material as we can because we don't assume that they're not interested or assume that it's not at their level. Um, if the child is, you know, physically able to and, you know, attention-wise able to, you know, sit during lecture time and participate, then, um, you know, why not? Like, why wouldn't you have them there? Right. Um, alternatively, if the child's attention span is not going to hold throughout the entire lecture, you can provide alternate forms of the lecture in terms of audio or visual. Um, you can have, uh, the, you know, the para or a peer sitting beside the student and sort of summarizing what's happening during the lecture. Um, the student can start on their activity a bit earlier than the rest of the students. So, you know, there are many different ways for the student to remain during, you know, remain through the throughout the lecture, um, but participating in a way that's best for them, and um, right. yeah, yeah, because I think um, you know sometimes, like you said, I think the most important you know foundation is that we're going to presume competence and that they're learning, and. You know, I think so many times during lectures, we think it's, you know, way over the child's yeah. head. What are they going to learn? But you'll be amazed at how much kids are really soaking up that information. Yeah. Um, and they might not be making eye contact or, you know, they might be doodling or something. Right. But there's, you know, that rich general ed classroom provides so much more yeah. um, for them. And I know for my son, you know, he loved, like, keeping track of where the teacher was in the lecture. So, right. you know, if she was using a PowerPoint and Dylan could have the PowerPoint, you know, he could know, like, what slide she's on. Totally. He could be looking at it, you know, and checking it off, you know, as he goes through. So yeah. there are other ways that you can keep them engaged. But, yeah, I really encourage, um, you know, with social studies and science and things like that, that are topics that – you know, kids love learning about different things. We yeah. want them to be in the classroom doing all of that, you know. Yeah, and I love that that um, idea of, you know, having the student track where their teacher is at in the lecture. Um, in modifications, they do take a lot of creativity sometimes. <laughs> There's no denying that. Um, another idea I heard recently, too, and I haven't really quite explored it, but um, teachers are starting to gamify their lessons. Right. Where, where uh, you know, kids level up or, you know, right. achieve a <laughs> achieve a avatar or something at certain points in the lesson to keep students engaged. And, and, and that sort of all is part and parcel of that whole universal design for learning concept where, you know, the teacher really, if they're standing up at the front of the class and just speaking to the class, maybe there could be a discussion with ways in which the teacher can present the material to make it more engaging. Because chances are it's not just going to be more engaging for your child, but for the rest of the class. <laughs> oh, that's totally true. And right. I think, you know, looking at your team, if your child gets speech and language support, having that person look at what the lectures are coming up, what the vocabulary yeah. is, pre-teaching that. Pre-teaching. You know, having the parents 
you know, I would always in the summer look at garage sales, yeah. <laughs> you know, for books. Like, I know they're going to be doing this subject next year. Let me look for some other books. Or, right. you know, how can I start talking about these subjects and topics during the summer? Right. You know, so there's things like that you can do, too. Um, and there's wonderful. Oh. Go ahead. Well, there's wonderful sites, too, that actually take uh, grade-level text and novels. Yes. Um, so what, Newzella is one of them. Um, I know somebody posted a, a wonderful site with a lot of like, you know, Shakespeare and um, kind of higher level text and it's been modified to a more accessible reading level. I, I'll have to, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I Charlie. know, and I, and I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to that. you. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, so there's so many adaptive novels that kids can yeah. use. And I just want to also too, if if I'm if I have time to advance through this quite sure. for just a minute, um, the modifications. This was a collecting one where the student, the kids were learning uh, some math concepts, and the student brought in a collection that they had had to share. Um, matching. Uh, this is a novel study where the students were doing comprehension activities, and the teacher had changed the concept level to include just words that. Um, you know, were appropriate for the student and related to the novel. This is one of my favorite ones <laughs> that a that a, a parent and I worked on, and this is the spelling list because a lot of teachers have questions. You know, a lot of parents have questions about the spelling list. How do we deal with the spelling list? Because that's not ever going to go away, <laughs> it seems. And in this one, um, we had worked together to find smaller words in the larger. Uh, words that were on the spelling list, and so the child was responsible for learning the smaller words. Um, so received the same list, but different concepts, conceptual level. And then finally, modifications can also happen in other areas of the curriculum, not just socials and science. So this is a modified PE uh, lesson where the student, you can see the rest of the class is learning how to play badminton and the rules of badminton. And in this situation, the student is working with a peer because peers are just as important in the process and um, and he's learning how to uh, toss the you know hit the birdie to a friend so still participating with the class but at his or her own level and that's really key because and I just want to mention that one more time is that um, modifications don't mean that your child has to work at the same level as the rest of the class that's not what modifications are they're working at a level that is suitable and appropriate to their own developmental um, level where they're at. So if your child is in a fifth grade class, um, they are not meant to be learning fifth grade standards if that's not what is achievable for them. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, we want to presume competence and presume that they can make achievements within the grade five curriculum, but we want to present that material in ways as, that is designed for them and, you know, where they can make progress. And um, because I know I have a lot of parents saying to me, well, how do I modify this work so that the student can still learn and have the same educational outcomes? Well, that's not what modifications are. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. that's a great clarification. Um, and I think uh, I wanted to share, too, if people want to get, what I'll be doing is making a transcription of this show. And we give that to our members. We have a membership group. So if you're interested in being a member, you can go at the top of my Facebook page and click on that image. But um, also, Nicole's book. I mean, yes. this would be like a wonderful teacher gift, right? <laughs> or, you know, you could ask the principal, you know, can we buy some of these books and, you know, have the teachers use it as a professional development activity. A lot of teachers have book clubs. So here's your book. So do you want to tell us a little bit yeah. about what's in the book? So this is um, what I've been working on the last couple of years. <laughs> Finally done. Um, this is a book that provides uh, teachers and, and parents with a real kind of foundation of what inclusive education is and why we do it. So it includes the research, it includes the whole concept of, you know, having the student not just be there for, you know, in the classroom, but actually participating in the curriculum. And then I give, uh, provide 40 different strategies um, to, for teachers to take curriculum and modify it for 
their students. So the strategies are like the ones that I showed you earlier, like find it, label it, yes or no. And they're very sort of like, you know, quick and easy strategies. Uh, they're low tech. I mean, you can take them and, um, you know, use them with iPads and software and apps and whatnot, but you can also just use pencil and paper for most of them as well. So there's not, you know, high-end technology needed. Um, and you can order it. Uh, the fastest way to get it at this point is to order it off the Brooks Publishing website. And you can see that the, uh, the address is down here. You just have to go to bit.ly forward slash Eridix, and that'll take you to um, the page where you can order it. There's also uh, a 10% discount that um, I can offer today. Uh, people, if they're ordering, you can put in the code A and then F is in Frank. And that's the promo code, and that will give you 20%, sorry, 10% off. Oh. 10 off. So just A, F for yeah. a code? Okay. Yeah. And that's yeah, the and promo I'll put code. that in the description too, and yeah. I'll put the link in there so you can click on it. Yeah. And then, of course, there's some, at the very back, there's some graphic organizers and templates that I've also provided to use with some of those strategies that uh, that are included in the book. So, um, plus resources and other sort of tips and tricks, and it's basically a, kind of a catch-all for, for teaching students um, with intellectual disabilities in the classroom. So, and but this will be such a great resource, Nicole. Yeah, I hope so. I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm that's what I, you know, I, I wrote it with, with uh, teachers in mind and, of course, parents. Um, like I said, you know, special education teachers have been trained for this, but the more inclusive we become in our classrooms, the more general education teachers need to know about this and parents as well. And so that was kind of the idea of the book is that it was just, it was written for um, not just teachers, but parents and administrators and, um, yeah, so... Uh, hey, that is awesome. And both um, Nicole and I are waiting for our book to be delivered yeah. at our door, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I'm like, Nicole, I haven't gotten mine. I pre-ordered it. And I said, but you probably have a copy you could hold up. <laughs> I don't even have my copy yet. <laughs> yes, and I pre-ordered it. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, it sounds no. like they'll be here within, you know, Days. within the week or whatever. So yeah. that is exciting. And um, like I had mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to do a giveaway. I'm not sure my IEP bot is awake today because I'm not sure <laughs> if you've written modifying the comments that you've been getting the automated response. But I'll come back in after the show and make sure that all of you guys are entered in the giveaway. And I'm going to have it go through Tuesday because people who watch the replay, I want them to be able to get in on the, the chance for the giveaway also. So, um that will be coming up for everybody. But Nicole, I want to thank you so much for being here. I know you. um, as you've been talking, people have been giving you lots of likes and hearts and have Aww. been just um, a lot of thank yous for, for being able to share your expertise and all the knowledge that you've had and the experience that you've had. And, um, Parents are very thankful and grateful that we have people like you who can be consultants to schools and and help more students, you know, be, like you said, actively participating and learning side by side with their peers, right? That's the goal. And I love sharing, um, you know, ideas and strategies and, um, you know, the experiences that I have had because, um, you know, I had to learn it myself when I was in the trenches. So, <laughs> you know, why, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult process. And, you know, why go through that alone when you don't have to? So, oh, exactly. um, and, and I encourage people to, you know, if they have more questions, please. Um, I've got my Facebook page, The Inclusive Class, and, I'm, you know, I'm on there quite a bit. <laughs> so you can uh, send me questions, and I'd be happy to answer them the best I can. Great, and I'll put the link for Nicole's um, Facebook page, The Inclusive Class, in our um, description also, so you can go over there and make sure you like her page, and she'll be there to answer, you know, follow-up questions that people have. Um, but thank you again for 
Thank you know, you. carving out this time. I know this is a busy time for you. Um, and I just want to let our listeners and viewers know that next Thursday we'll be doing a show about extended school year because that's a topic of discussion in the springtime. Um, and so next Thursday we'll be looking at that. But thank you again, Nicole. Thank and you. Maybe we won't make this, you know, you have to wait another year. We'll Annually. Come back soon. <laughs> Why have you come back sooner? <laughs> I love to. I love these discussions, and uh, I love being able to, um, like I said, share, share the things that I've learned over the years. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Okay. See okay. everybody next week. Take yes. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.